this is going to be a more detailed study on the topic of was it a literal talking snake in Genesis 3, which it wasn't. Um, but I have this printed out from agapegeek.com. Um, really good. But he does go into the Hebrew and Greek text and all that, so I, I tried to cut all that out. But I'm basically, I'm just going to read through this. It's pretty long, but it covers a lot of points. Um, so, yeah. So, Genesis 3.1, we're going to start talking about the created set called Beasts of the Field. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, that the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree, of every tree of the garden. Okay. How did God create every beast, living animal, on this planet? Didn't God create the beast of, of the field and say that they were all good? In Genesis 1.25, and very good in Genesis 1.31, God is not evil, and very good is definitely not anything that is bad. There were no evil connotations placed upon any of the created beings found in Genesis 1. Um, so, for to say that the serpent was very subtle, it's saying, you know, it was subtle, that's like a bad thing. That it was very cunning. Okay, so for God to say that he created every beast good, then, you know, this can't be talking about that, the beast that God created like that. Um, you, did you notice that this verse did not say other? It does not say, now the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field. Okay, and that's important. Isn't a natural and physical snake one of those beasts of the field that the Lord God has made? The logical conclusion has to be that the serpent was not a member of that category of the made or created creatures of the field. If the objective any is placed before the noun beasts, we have to conclude that there are no beasts omitted from this grouping. Any is an all-inclusive statement that omits none of them. By God not putting the word other after the word any, we know concretely that the reference serpent in the beginning of the statement was not a member of that set of created living creatures. In other words, there was no physical, literal, created talking snake based just upon the correct reading, understanding, and interpretation of this verse. So it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the, beast of the field. Any beast of the field would include a literal snake. So, this, the serpent that it's speaking of is outside of, of every beast of the field, okay? It can't be a literal talking snake. Let's continue. Natural or supernatural temptation. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us, There hath no temptation overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Um, any satanic temptation is one that is natural is a natural temptation, meaning it is not a supernatural temptation. Did you realize that according to what God has just written in His Word, that it is illegal for Satan to tempt you supernaturally? What is a supernatural temptation? That would be any temptation that did not occur naturally by created design or created laws or any temptation of a non-created material substance or nature. Have you ever seen a talking snake? If you can find one, if you can find me one, I would love to see it. And this would provide the evidence to support a literal talking snake in the garden, being the tempter. Seeing talking snakes in the past and today would make this type of temptation a common occurrence to man. However, I've been to many zoos, and if there are, were any talking snakes, I didn't see them. No, you see, a talking snake would be a supernatural temptation, a non-common human temptation occurrence that would cause... God's word in 1 Corinthians 10.13 to become a lie. Since God does not lie, I have to conclude that there was no literal talking snake in the garden. So again, I'll say 1 Corinthians 10.13 hath, There hath no temptation overtaken you, but such as is common to man. A talking snake would not be something that is common. How does God tempt someone today? Or how does Satan tempt someone? Sorry, not God. <laughs> uh... 
Have you ever been tempted by Satan? Sure you have, whether you admit it or not. How did he come to you and try to tempt you? Did Satan have to manifest himself in the body of an animal to tempt you? Of course he did not. He didn't. Satan, when he comes, he speaks in your mind. By using your thought life to tempt you to do something that you shouldn't, or to say something that you shouldn't, or whatever, if Satan tempted you this way, then he tempted Eve this way also. Do you think we can find any scripture to confirm this? Of course we can if we look. Second Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds be corrupted from the subtle simplicity that is in Christ. It is amazing what the Bible says when you look at it. Understand it and apply it to Genesis 3 interpretation correctly. You see, this verse is written to the church, and it said Eve was deceived by the serpent because of his trickery. But did you notice how he did it? This temptation occurred in Eve's mind, and it was not carried out by a talking supernatural snake in the garden. How can we further confirm this? Ask yourself, was there ever any mention in Genesis 3 of Adam hearing the, voice, the snake's voice? If you read closely, you will observe that God rebukes Adam for hearkening to the voice of his wife and never mentions the voice of the serpent to Adam. Was not Adam standing next to Eve in the garden? If there was a literal talking snake present, then there would have been an audible voice for Adam to also hear. I really believe that that Bible need to learn to learn to read and see what is there and what is not there and quit adding to the words to make them say something that they do not say. We have just learned from God's commentary on the story of Genesis 3 that whatever Satan said to Eve was a thought in her mind, and this caused her to be deceived. Satan is still the same subtle deceiver today, and he works and operates in the exact same way that he has always worked. He tries to deceive you through the same avenues of your mind. This verse clearly warns the church to watch their thoughts in order to keep Satan from corrupting their minds. That is why he... We are instructed in the Bible in this way. Hang on a second. My bad. Okay. Okay, continuing here. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth, bring, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Apparently our minds are still the battleground for the attacks of the enemy and we are responsible to police this mental realm and exercise our authority to keep the enemy out of there. Because preachers and teachers believe that Satan had to borrow the body of a physical snake in order to manifest himself in the earth, they think... This is the only way he can communicate to you. We have clearly seen that this is not the case using the Bible. Eve was clearly deceived in her mind. You can also be deceived in your mind if you let him operate there. God tells us what to think on in the Bible. Perhaps you should go and search for them and learn to keep only those things in your mind. What would happen if Satan entered, in, entered an animal's body? I think now would be a good time to introduce you to another set of scriptures that is certainly related to our subject study. If Satan had to borrow the body of a literal physical snake in order to manifest himself to Adam and Eve, what would happen if he actually did this? According to the Bible, it is not a positive outcome for the natural snake. You can see in the Gospel where Jesus, when he walked, to the, walked the face of the earth and came across a man who was possessed of devils in Matthew 8, the devil started to talk and uh, started to talk to Jesus and asked Jesus if they could go into the bodies of the herd of swine that were nearby. Jesus said, "Go." The devils went out of the man and went into the nearby natural animals. Then what happened to the animals? Matthew eight thirty two says, "And he said unto them, Go." And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Apparently animals are aware when evil spirit enters into them. Did you see this? The animals were driven mad and committed suicide. After the suicide, the evil spirits had no living bodies to possess. 
So they went about looking for another human to deceive. Did you learn anything from the story? Did you see how it applies to Genesis 3.1? Yes, it is confirmed that a spirit being can enter into the body of even a snake, but we must conclude that from what from what was just presented that the snake would have not been a willing participant to the possession. God gives us clues like this in the Bible, and we are required to put the clues together in order to understand what is being said. What we have learned is that even animals have a sensitivity to spiritual beings. Sometimes I think that animals are more sensitive than many people about pending disasters. Cats and dogs can sense earthquakes before they happen. Animals around the coast line ran to higher ground before the tsunami killed so many people a few years ago. Do not assume or think that any animal will just allow a devil to come into them and use them without knowing about it. This is just another reason I do not believe there was a physical talking snake in the garden. Is the serpent literal or symbolic? Now, there is a major problem being presented for those who want to take every scripture literally. You see, the problem is that the serpent must be purely symbolic reference for a spiritual being that was not directly named or identified in the book of Genesis at all. You see, I have been talking like you already knew that the serpent was Satan throughout this Bible study, but I have offered no biblical proof to confirm this fact. How do we know that the serpent was Satan and not a literal talking created snake? I state the serpent was Satan based upon where else the serpent is mentioned in scriptures. God gives us the definition of the serpent in the last book of the Bible. You do understand that God is the author of the entire Bible, don't you? You do understand that God can give new information for the same subject found in Genesis wherever he desires to, don't you? You see, God uses a symbolic serpent to describe Satan in several places in the Bible, but I will only give you two verses that identifies the serpent's real name to us very clearly. Revelation 12:9 and the great dragon was cast out the old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 22 and he seized the garden that ancient serpent who is the devil and satan and bound him for a thousand years. We can see from these verses in Revelation the true identity of the symbolic old serpent is revealed to us to be Satan the deceiver. These verses also contain another symbolic reference and calls Satan the great dragon. Apparently Satan's strength and ability has increased substantially as the symbolic dragon at the end to a level greater than he possessed at the beginning as, his, as the symbolic serpent. You can clearly see why God selected to use the symbolic references in both places of the Bible. By comparing these two symbolic references, we can gain additional information about this unseen spiritual enemy named Satan. What I am doing is attempting to teach you that God reveals the true identity of the symbolic serpent found in Genesis 3.1. You can see two times in Revelation 12.9 and Revelation 22 that the serpent is a symbolic reference for the devil called Satan. If the serpent is not literal here in the, these verses, there is no legitimate way for the serpent to be literal in Genesis either. So we've just learned a valuable lesson of why we can't take everything in the Bible literally. We have also learned that we can't study any book of the Bible independently in a vacuum. We must always use the Bible to interpret the Bible. We must see that God, what God says about the subject we are studying in the Old Testament in the other places of the New Testament because He always provides additional information, ex explanations, and definitions that are critical for us to see in order to correctly understand what is being taught. What about Genesis 3.14? I am now going to respond to the direct reader question, what about Genesis 3.14? You see, in the past there has been so many Bible teachers within the Christian body that have taught concerning the existence of a literal talking snake in the garden which tempted Adam and Eve to sin that, is, that it is now difficult for anyone to accept any new revelation on the subject. This popular natural way of thinking and teaching promoted the creation of a commonly misunderstood physical interpretation which violates the information given to us by God in the Bible, the natural laws of creation, and the mathematical laws of God. People often believe that God created these laws, but then they do not believe that God chooses to live by them, and I do not agree with that religious philosophy. That type of reasoning promotes a God that says, Do as I say, but, not, but do not do as I do. But do not do as I do. Man being made in the image and likeness of God clearly must learn to follow and conform to his example of behavior or we just fail in our own efforts. I believe 
firmly that man was created to be an imitator of God's ways. Jesus clearly provided humans an example of this divine lifestyle in the natural when God appeared personally upon this planet. Our Christian belief of following God's and Jesus' examples has created the popular modern concept of what would Jesus do. When humans are faced with challenging situations and circumstances, they should stop and ask, what would Jesus do? I believe a Christian should act like Christ, look like Christ, and speak like Christ, and in doing these point others to Christ. You are free to disagree and not attempt to be like Christ. This prominent teaching of a literal snake is also directly linked into the propagation of the many paintings of a naked man and woman in the garden picture, being pictured with a serpent and the tree performing performing the temptation to eat the forbidden fruit. This has been the prevalent traditional viewpoint of this chapter. And people accept it today because it has been so frequently and widely taught. Everyone in the world telling you the same story over and over, and us all hearing it told over and over, causes people to accept it and to believe it more easily, even if it was never true. I have never learned this concept by observing what has been happening in the world in the last 50 years with the gay community message. 50 years ago, gays were not accepted and even looked negatively upon for their poor choice and lifestyles. But during this time, more and more sodomites, I'll change the gay sodomites there, have been opening up and coming out of the closet to proclaim themselves as being normal. 25 are TV and movies began introducing the subject in the 1970s, and now it is mainstream and widely preached. In the last 50 years, sodomites have increasingly proclaimed their uh, normalcy and demanded their acceptance, and finally now the majority of the people in the world are buying into these lies to believe them as a truth. However, even if everyone in the full agreement with a belief, that does not change the belief to be a God-inspired truth. Truth is only found in the words of God, but only the Spirit of God can reveal to us His truth in His Word. This teaching about a literal talking serpent is what I call a tradition of men, taught by men, passed upon a man's carnal human reasoning rather than the actual biblical spiritual insight from God. We should become smart enough to see that none of these Bible teachers that teach on the subject of a literal talking snake can provide us with sufficient scriptures to back up their belief. The Bible very clearly says to let every word be established in the mouths of two or three witnesses, Matthew eighteen sixteen, and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. That means we need at least one other reference apart from Genesis 3 where an actual serpent speaks to tempt a human in order to embrace the concept, that concept fully. Can you search your Bible and find one for me? God has established specific rules for rightly dividing the word of truth and not knowing these rules or choosing to ignore them will result in chaos and a chaos random Bible interpretation where any interpretation is truth. We need to become wiser Christians verifying what people teach, applying the correct rules and not accepting blindly anything just because they said it. Acts 17.11 That is what I want you to do with everything that I am going to say today. You analyze it closely with the information found only in the Bible and if you don't see it, like I said, then it's fine with me. Don't believe it. What God has shown me is that there was no literal talking snake in the garden. There are two primary reasons why many Christians do not see what is written by God in the Bible, and one is that they think from uh, they think totally natural, ignoring the spiritual elements of application, or two, they do not know how to study the Bible from a God's spiritual author perspective. I am going to address both of these situations today in this lesson. My goal today is to teach you to think spiritually concerning Genesis 3.14, you may not yet understand that thinking carnally is different than thinking spiritually, but if you continue to read with an open mind, you should be able to make the transition. Carnally dominated people think that they, if they cannot see it, touch it, feel it, hear it, smell it, or taste it, then they believe that it is not reality or a state of truth. And thinking this way, they believe that spiritual things do not exist or that natural things are superior to spiritual things. Carnal thinkers are totally dominated by the five sense realm. Spiritual thinkers are more influenced with the spirit of God, the word of God, and the unseen spiritual realm. Being spiritually dominated versus being naturally dominated should become your goal today, even if you do not understand it yet.
Ask yourself if natural things take precedence and priority over the spiritual things in your life. Maybe I'll help you. Is eating natural food a bigger priority than eating God's spiritual food from the Bible? God says very clearly that the unseen spiritual things are literally more important and permanent than anything observable here in this natural universe. That was my prayer phase of a verse found in 2 Corinthians 4.18. Since all natural things were created by a spirit, John 4.24, it should be self-evident that the spiritual realm pre-existed everything that is natural, and therefore the spiritual realm is greater by definition. What does it mean to be greater? Is the created automobile greater than the manufacturer, or is the manufacturer of the automobile superior to the created automobile? If the manufacturer was broken, the automobile could not fix it. But if the automobile was broken, clearly the manufacturer could certainly repair it. I think you get my point that only the Spirit of God can fix a human to see his spiritual, his superior spiritual ways. Uh, okay. So Genesis 3.14 says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you, above all livestock and above all beasts of the field on your belly you shall go and dust shall dust you shall eat all the days of your life um, now if we look at Genesis 49:17 it says Dan shall be a serpent by the way an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so so that his rider shall fall backward okay is that talking about Dan will, uh, you know, will be a, a literal serpent? No. So that's that's an example in Genesis forty nine seventeen where a serpent is is symbolically taken. You know, we don't take that as a literal thing. Um, we know in Job. One seven it says, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence, whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. We know that Satan communicates with God. Um, you know, the serpent that is in Genesis three is really intelligent. It already had knowledge of what God said to Eve. Um, there are three different ways to look at this: a literal talking snake. That's a natural only interpretation. Uh, the devil possesses a literal snake with the devil doing the speaking. That's a combined natural with spiritual interpretation. And the third way to look at it is the devil in the spirit realm talking to the mind of Eve, a spiritual only interpretation. Okay. And when we know that the literal, the straight up literal interpretation, that's just out of there. But the, the combined is out of there too. Um, this has to be a spiritual interpretation. Um, here are some of the facts presented so far. One, we know the serpent is smart and possesses great intelligence. Two, we know that the serpent had recall of past events even when not stated to be present during the occurrence of them. We know the spirit knew what God had said in previous conversations with Adam. Three, we know that the serpent can remember, think, and reason. Four, we know that the serpent can speak clearly understandable words. Five, we know that the serpent predicts the future, speaking of events that have not transpired. Whether they are completely accurate or fictitious is really irrelevant to the facts given. And six, we know from verse one in Genesis three that the serpent is very cunning. Okay, so we're going to continue on with Genesis three fourteen. Um, because you have done this, cursed are you more than any cattle, more than every beast of the field. Um, again, in this next statement of Genesis 3.14, we can see a common theme reappearing from Genesis 3.1, in that the serpent is similarly compared to the cattle, a subset of the beasts of the field, and then God compares the serpent to the su superset of all the beasts of the field. We should easily know that a literal serpent is not from the livestock mammal class of beings, so that it is pretty simple to understand that the serpent does not belong in that set of class or class of created beings. But again, in this verse, we see the word all being placed in front of the noun. 
set of the beasts of the field. To qualify the applicable scope of statement, since any, every, all are synonyms, terms, synonymous terms, and they mean none are omitted from the spe specified set or reference nouns, we know by the statement made by God alone that that the specified serpent is not a member of the beasts of the field, superset or class of created beings either. This is not rocket science, but people ignore the words on the page to render what they want them to say. God chose these words, so it is very important for you not to ignore one word like all, because it does not conform to what you think it needs to say. Let's move on to the last controversial statement that was made by God to the serpent and explore this for the remainder of the Bible lesson. So basically in Genesis 3.14, again it says, um, Cursed are you more than all cattle and than every beast of the field. So every beast of the field would include a literal talk, would inclu include a literal snake. So he's not talking to a literal snake, okay? It, the serpent is Satan, not a literal talking snake. Okay, but anyways, <clears throat> on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. People still look at this last statement in verse 14 wondering what it means. In fact, that is exactly what initiated this entire Bible lesson and why I am attempting to respond to two different commentators or commenters. God says in the last part of this verse that the serpent will travel on its belly and eat dust. Here is where people again begin to jump to erroneous assumptions and wrong conclusions, misunderstanding and misapplying what was actually stated. Because everyone knows that has seen a literal modern snake at the zoo or in their yard that they slither on the ground on their bellies as the primary way to get around, they therefore assume that this is what God was declaring to happen. Thus they believe that God was talking to a literal snake, and this is where they become more creative again to imagine or invent some new unstated explanation of what God just said in his word. I have heard more than one preacher try to claim that the serpent before the curse walked using legs, but after the curse his legs were removed, and now he had to slither in the dust on its belly. And I've heard that. And it's just ridiculous. Okay, let's stop believing this trash. Continuing, that is the required logic that must have transpired for a literal interpretation. But that type of belief or reasoning is based upon a form of reverse evolution. Reverse evolution occurs when a higher form creature returns, regresses, reverts, or mutates backwards to a lesser or inferior form of creation. This belief is the stated antithesis of the theory of evolution also taught as the evolving of lesser beings classes that are raised to a higher state of development class by some unknown, unknown miracle. I have a major problem with believing in either of those t two theoretical scenarios since there was no written evidence or fossil evidence that either of these theories ever occurred. If there were walking snakes before the fall then there should be some fossil evidence for them found somewhere on the earth. Instead of thinking on these words from a completely natural perspective, inventing creative untruths to conform them, let's divert our attention away and try to see the words from a new spiritual point of view. We can only counter theories with facts. We therefore need facts from the Bible that trump the reverse evolution belief. Do you understand what symbolism is in the Bible? I have already tried to explain that the serpent was a symbolic reference to a spiritual being named Satan as, as revealed by God in Revelation. God uses vast amounts of symbolism in the book of Revelation, but yet people like to think that God never used symbolism anywhere else in the Bible, especially in Genesis. Suddenly people want to think that God changes to do something new in Revelation and uses a novel technique never, used, never before used in the Bible. But that is clearly not sound reasoning to think that way. For example, Jesus taught consistently in the Gospels using parables. What is a parable? A parable is a lesson about spiritual things using natural symbolic references to convey the message. Clearly Jesus used natural symbols, and I could give you other uses of symbols in the Bible. If you do not believe me, ask me a question and I will supply you with an introduction to the subject found in the Old Testament and even in Genesis.
There is another important concept that is related directly to symbolism found in the Bible called a figure of speech. Do you understand what a figure of speech represents? I'll not go into this in depth, but I will attempt to give you a couple examples of a figure of speech to help affirm the conclusion. If a person today says, you are a pain in my neck, was he saying something literally or figuratively? I believe you are smart enough to know that this is a figurative description of the person and not a literal one. You can see God is using an illustrated type of speaking example in the Bible several times when he says to the natural people of Israel, wipe them out or they will become thorns in your side. Numbers 3355 um, Joshua 23:13 and Judges 2:3. You see God was not speaking to Israel literally, so he must have been declaring a figurative statement that they should have been smart enough to recognize. What is a thorn in your side? That is just an example of someone who causes you physical, mental, or emotional harm or causes you to stumble over something that results in physical, mental, or emotional harm. In these three Bible examples that I just gave you, God was saying to these people, I, saying these people will introduce you to their idols, and by you worshiping them, these people will cause you great negative consequences. That is exactly what God was doing in Genesis 3.14 when speaking to the symbolic serpent. God was not telling the serpent that he just lost his legs. He was saying something else which you do not even yet understand. Um... But yeah, like I said in the other video, it's a figure of speech, you know, and you shall eat dust. It's literal snakes eat rodents, not dust, okay? And, you know, it's just like saying, you know, you're toast, or whatever, you know, that's not literal, it's a figure of speech. Uh, so, rules for Old Testament Bible interpretation. How can we find the meaning of these figurative and symbolic words in the Old Testament? How do we understand any verse written in the Old Testament if the Jews could read them all for centuries, but never saw any of the words that describe Jesus' coming. These are finally great questions to answer. Please allow me to introduce you to some very basic rules for Old Testament Bible interpretation and understanding. Read these rules over, and then I'll explain them and apply them more completely as we continue into the rest of this Bible study. We can only understand the Old Testament by one, first understanding that the Bible is one book written by one author with superior intelligence, 2 Timothy 3.16. Therefore, we must not study one part of the Bible trying to understand it while ignoring the other parts of the Bible that reveal it. Number two, secondarily, secondarily understanding that the Bible interprets itself and we need not add our own opinion or the mix to the mix, or we will violate God's law of correct interpretation found in 2 Peter 1.20. Number three, next understanding the revelations, explanation, and descriptions of the words, concepts, and subjects found in the verses in the New Testament. The Bible is progressive revelation, also called the unveiling, the uncovering, or the revelation of the truth, Romans 16.25. Number four, searching, finding, and observing God's definitions of the words and subjects in the New Testament and other parts of the Bible where they are given, Colossians 1, 26. And number five, observing the context of the verses around it. Okay. Okay. That is certainly not an exhaustive, uh, okay. Let's get through some of this. Okay, so rules one and two, allowing God to interpret his word. I want to begin with rules one and two of every sound Bible interpretation. We must allow God, the author of the entire Bible, to interpret his own words in order to leave our thoughts out of the meanings. God's mind is superior to my mind and yours. When we introduce the thoughts of our mind into the discussion, we introduce the, an inferior process and way of thinking. I have discovered from many years of the Bible study that God is smart enough to interpret his own writings if we can become smart enough to learn how to find them and apply them. That is your number one challenge being issued within the Word of God. Go find the verses that explain the verse that you want to learn about in the Old Testament. That is what we need to do so... Next, let's go looking for some New Testament expl expl 
explanatory words for what we have read in Genesis 3.14. Rules 3 and 4. What does the New Testament teach about serpents? Since someone was questioning if the serpent in Genesis 3 was literal or symbolic, we need to ask, what does the New Testament say about serpents? And how should these references be applied to this question concerning Genesis 3? Can you see that I have already answered a portion of the questions in the previous lessons in the series? I pointed you to two verses in Revelation, Revelation 12.9 and Revelation 22, where God directly identifies the names of the old, the old serpent and the ancient serpent to be the literal enemy, Satan. This was a God-inspired definition that was further mentioned within the context of another symbolic name for the same individual called the dragon. And the truth helps teach to teach us that the serpent and the dragon are both symbolic titles for Satan. We need to treat both reference titles of the serpent and the dragon to be equivalent for the literal spiritual being named Satan. There are also other references to a serpent in Revelation, and one is found in Revelation 9.19, where God uses the same word to be like something else. This fact teaches us that God is in the practice of using a serpent as symbolism to teach us about spiritual things that we have never observed with our eyes. The next reference that I gave was that of Revelation 12.9. But also, this same chapter, God uses the serpent again as symbolism to be associated with the symbolic woman as mentioned in the same chapter. I hope that you have already read my Bible study on Genesis 3.15 called The Seed of the Woman and the Seed of the Serpent. Uh, if not, you really do not understand that Genesis 3.15 and Revelation 12 are parallel prophecies of a soon coming future event. If you continue to read down in Revelation 12 to verse 14, you will see that the woman, you will see the woman and the serpent being mentioned in the same verse. I'm not going to elaborate on these, just understand that they are both symbolic for someone else. Um, hmm. and I don't know what that, that uh, seed of the woman and seed of the serpent thing is I've heard of some serpent seed doctrine I haven't really checked into it it's supposed to be false or whatever but that, that doesn't really matter concerning this subject but anyways <clears throat> in the very next verse Revelation 12.15 you will find the fifth reference in Revelation to a serpent in this verse, you should be smart enough to see that this serpent is again a symbolic reference, and he is stated to spew symbolic water out of his mouth, like a flood to cause the woman to be carried away by the flow. I really do not have time to teach this chapter in full, just understand that the woman and the serpent are both clear symbols for a greater defined spiritual reality, and God is for the woman and against the serpent. We know that the woman is not named for... A, named or identified directly but the serpent was and that is what we were searching for to understand in Genesis 3.14 this is just very basic information that helps us to confirm that the serpent in Genesis 3.1 through 3.14 was not a literal reference but <clears throat> rather also a symbolic association the term serpent is only mentioned 15 verses of the King James New Testament only once can it possibly be considered to be a literal created serpent moving on the ground. Let me give you all these verses so that you can review them for yourself to learn how God uses them. Okay, Matthew 7.10 is a symbolic reference. Uh, it referenced, it's referenced by Jesus in a teaching about Father giving the Holy Spirit. Matthew 10.16, symbolic reference. Referenced by Jesus in a teaching to his disciples about them being wise as serpents but harmless as doves, both symbolic references. Matthew 23, 33, symbolic and figurative speaking. Jesus speaking of speaking the leaders of Israel, calling them a generation of vipers. Uh, Mark 16, 18, symbolic. Jesus instructing the disciples after his resurrection, often called the Great Commission. Luke 10.19, symbolic, Jesus speaking in context, contextual reference to Satan giving authority to his church to tread on the serpent. Uh, <clears throat> Luke 11.11, 11, symbolic, Jesus speaking to the church about the Father in heaven giving the Holy Spirit. 
John 14, symbolic, reference to Old Testament symbol being placed on a pole by Moses. 1 Corinthians 10, 19, symbolic slash literal, possibly a reference to either or both a symbolic and literal snakes killing Israel, Israeli people in the wilderness who disobeyed God. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, symbolic, an explanatory reference written about Eve being deceived in her mind by the serpent. James 3 7 literal here James is using a reference to taming created animals and creatures but this is a totally different uh, okay anyways that's a literal one James 3 7 Revelation 9 19 symbolic used by God to describe four angels that kill one-third of the human race during the tribulation Revelation 12.9, symbolic, verse where God identifies Satan to be the, the serpent of old. Revelation 12.14, symbolic, symbolic connection of the woman and the serpent found in Genesis 3.15. Revelation 12.15, symbolic, symbolic connection of the woman and the serpent in Genesis 3.15. And finally, Revelation 20, symbolic, God again clarifies the identity of the ancient serpent to be Satan. Okay, so these are 14 verses that they're talking about a serpent. Uh, and the evidence is very clear to me that the vast majority of New Testament word usage must be considered as a symbolic references to a spiritual being. The only verse that I could possibly leave to be a natural snake was 1 Corinthians 10:19, when God was describing what occurred to the natural people of Israel and the wilderness after they disobeyed God. Every other reference appears to be a symbol for Satan and the enemy of God. I can still see how people could argue about some verses being literal, but that is probably because they do not see what is stated. For example, the two times that J Jesus speaks about a father giving his son a serpent when the, snake, when the son asks for a fish is definitely an example of a parable where all named nouns represent a spiritual reality not named. The literal symbol of the snake in these verses is used by Jesus to teach a spiritual lesson. Then consider John 3.14, where the serpent was placed on a pole to bring healing to the people of Israel in the wilderness. This, clearly, this is clearly another symbolic representation for Christ being made sin for the salvation of his people in the New Testament. I do not know how you can ignore all this evidence. If the New Testament references are 13 out of 14 for the serpent being symbolic in the New Testament, then this teaches us that we must consider this information and apply it to what we are trying to understand in the Old Testament. God would not have given us so many clear examples if we were supposed to not understand them. So if you did not realize it already, I have just used the first four rules of Old Testament Bible interpretation to discover the explanation, definition, and identity of the serpent in Genesis 3. Okay. Rule 5. What is the context of Genesis 3.14? Let's move on to rule number 5 for correct Bible interpretation. This rule involves us observing the context of the verse in question. This would include the speakers, the participants, and the intended reader audience. Let's begin this section of the study by observing the next verse 15 following Genesis 3.14 because I believe this is very relevant information. I have already published a Bible study on the subject that you should have previously read, but if not, I'll go back over parts of it very quickly. The statement in verse 15 is a continuation of the statement in verse 14. Do you understand this? Therefore, whatever God was talking about in verse 14 is still being continued in verse 15. I cannot disconnect the two verses, and neither can you if you use wisdom. God is still speaking to the same symbolic serpent, but God is now introducing a new, important connection to, to the serpent, for the serpent. I'll give you the verse so you can read it again for a mental refresher. Genesis 3.15, And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God introduces us to a woman in verse 15, and he clearly, and he declares... To be the serpent's new forthcoming or prophetical enemy. God says very clearly, I will put enmity, hostility or hatred between you, the serpent, and her, the woman. Right there, that that new statement should be become a mental turn on the light bulb moment clue for you that this stated serpent is not a literal, physical, talking snake. 
Yes, women are not the usual friends with natural snakes, but that is clearly not what God is saying in this prophecy. You do realize that this statement was a prophetical statement, don't you? Eve was the only literal, physical woman present during this conversation. Therefore, you must show me where she ever stopped, stepped on the head of this physical snake to bruise her heel or to bruise the literal serpent's head. Since you cannot find a verse that states this occurred, that is a major problem for a physical or literal snake's existence as being cursed by God in verse 14. A physical serpent's lifespan in this day and age is less than 50 years by far. Therefore, this event, if it was a literal snake, must have occurred during a time span of reasonable age less than the lifetime of the woman of this chapter. In this chapter, since it was not recorded as a past event, we must now reassess if a literal snake makes any logical sense at all anywhere in this chapter. No, God again speaking purely prophetically and figuratively in verse 15, using natural symbols for a coming spiritual event. The woman is symbolic, the seed is symbolic, the heel is symbolic, and therefore the serpent must also be symbolic along with the head of the serpent. If you can find me where any literal woman, heel, or seed steps on the head of any literal snake to bruise it, then we can all join together into the same belief that this is a literal, historic account of literal beings. Uh, I believe that we have just confirmed, what we have just confirmed is that verse 15 is symbolic and matches what I previously showed you to be symbolic references in Revelation 12. If the context of Genesis 3.15 is both prophetic and symbolic, then the previous verse 14 references must also be prophetic and symbolic, and that changes most everyone's way of viewing it. This means that verse 14, the serpent is symbolic, the valley of the serpent is symbolic, and even the dust is symbolic for some things that you have not yet discovered. Who knows what if I have convinced anyone who knows if I have convinced anyone yet, but we are not finished with the study, so please continue to read the next important Bible interpretation rule application. How does God, rule number six, how does God use this phrase in other Old Testament verses? Let's review what else God says about this subject in the Old Testament to consider the further usage of the words found in Genesis 3.14. We are interested primarily in what God says about a serpent eating dust. So I did search for these key words and found a verse that you must read and apply to what was stated by God in Genesis 3.14. Obviously, God knew that he would have many people that would not understand his selection of these words in Genesis 3.14, so he uses them again to teach us what they mean later in another prophet's words. Read this verse slowly and carefully and observe it to be a prophecy on the same subject. Okay, Micah 7.17 They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God. They shall fear because of thee. I need you to examine this verse word by word, and then, if you don't know the answers to my questions, go and read the context of this verse to see who God is speaking to and about. I guess I was going to first ask you who and what this verse is concerning, but I better just answer it for you so you learn how to do this. If you go back to Micah 1.1, 1, 1, you will find God informing the prophet Micah uh, concerning the kings of Judah, concerning the area of Samaria and the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, the rest of this book is written by that direction and must be interpreted in that light. When God writes to them and tells them in chapter 7, verse 17, that they will lick the dust like a serpent, or that literal, is that literal or is that figuratively speaking terminology? Hmm... I can see how people will try to make it literal, but God is speaking to men using symbolic application. I connected this verse in Micah to Genesis by looking for serpent and dust together in the same verse. God uses a synonymous reference for eating with the term lick, but they are basically equivalent phrasings. I can very clearly eat an ice cream cone by licking it. Let's pursue another example of God's usage of this term in another prophet's writing. Isaiah 65:25 The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain saith the Lord Did you read this verse and consider how it applies to Genesis 
is the verse in Isaiah speaking literally or figuratively? I also want you to ask, is this statement historical, past tense description, uh, present tense right now at the time of the writing description, or a prophetical future tense based event description? I can clearly potentially hear many different answers to my question, but only one answer can be correct. Since this is the prophet Isaiah writing many, many years after Moses wrote Genesis 3.14, and both are speaking of the same thing, I cannot agree that this occurred in past history in Genesis 3. No, I see both statements in Genesis 3 and Isaiah 65 to be written about a future coming prophetic event that has not yet occurred. If you do not agree, then explain to, to me why you ever saw a, when you ever saw a lamb lie down with a lamb and dwell in peace and safety. Uh, or a wolf and a lamb, I guess he meant to say. I don't know. For that matter... When was the last time? Yeah, when was the last time you saw a wolf eat straw regularly? Uh, then analyze the last part of this verse and tell me when this has occurred in the Bible. God describes that His holy mountain will never again be destroyed, nor will there be found any hurt or pain present there. I just don't have the time to explain this verse fully. Please know that this has not occurred, has not yet occurred, and will not occur until the end of Revelation, the last chapters. Then know that if this verse is a future speaking prophecy, it helps us to understand how Genesis thirteen three fourteen is concerned concerning the same prophecy. Okay, so conclusion to all of this. Since I have already used Rule Seven in previous discussions, um, yeah, blah blah. You know, so anyways, if you still think that it's a literal talking snake after all this, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> just need to quit thinking that, and just you know, understand what scripture has to say about that. And some people will say, well, you know, God spoke through a donkey, but that it says that the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. Okay, it doesn't say that, you know, Satan opened a snake's mouth in Genesis 3, it doesn't say Satan went into a snake. You know, there's nothing about snakes or animals talking before the fall. So, this is just all something that someone has made up, and many, 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 many people have been led to believe this, that it was a literal snake in Genesis 3. Like, even Sam Gibb, and if you go to gotquestions.com, of course, I mean, they're not right on a lot of stuff, but there are just so many places. Uh, I think even Answers in Genesis tries to say that it was a literal talking snake. So, I hope that um, you're convinced that it's not a literal talking snake. But anyways, thanks for watching this. It was pretty long. A lot of reading. So, thanks. God bless. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.